I would come in and I would cry because of all the sickness that was around me. And I knew that that sickness was deadly. My name is Edna Register Boone. I was born in 1907 in rural Houston County, Alabama. Times were troubled. A war going on, flu epidemic that followed the boll weevil. Three catastrophes right there. I was 10 years old. And my family was the only family in the little town that did not contact the flu. Therefore, my parents became automatic nurses. They nursed every family in town. My name is Kenneth C. Davis, and I am the author of More Deadly Than War, The Hidden History of the Spanish Flu and the First World War. I have to say that growing up, I never heard about the Spanish flu. It was not in my school books. It was not in my textbooks. So that when I did eventually learn about it and discovered that the most deadly pandemic in American history had happened in 1918 during World War I, it piqued my fascination as a historian. What was so unusual about the 1918 influenza was its impact on people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, who were getting sick and dying in numbers that doctors had never seen before. One doctor who's up in an army camp in Massachusetts is looking at these men coming in and they're piling up and they're dragging it themselves in by the hundreds. And they're dying to the point that he says they're stacked like cordwood. And he said, maybe this is a new plague. It started in March of 1918 in the United States, primarily on U.S. Army bases, where millions of young men were being trained to get ready to go to war in Europe. That's where the flu really spread. From there, it went on to trains as they moved to the ports. Then they got onto ships and went to Europe. Every ship that was sent over, filled with nine or 10,000 young men, became floating coffins. A doctor in New York describes hundreds of patients coming in. He said, they're spitting blood, they're turning blue, and they're dying. He had never seen anything like this. People were actually bleeding from the eyes, ears, nose, and mouth. We had no sanitary conditions in the area at that time. The people were buried in the clothes they died in and wrapped in the sheets because there was no way to wash the bed linens for them. So they were buried in a common grave. I do not remember a single church burial. We had it in the neighborhood. Everybody thought it was terrible, your disease. We didn't travel much back then because we didn't have much way of traveling. And we stayed at home, but we knew how bad it infected some in the neighborhood. They were deathly sick and bedridden. Fear was the main thing. My age was going on five year old, and my dad had this influenza. He lost conscience for three days and nights, and then lived. And it was awful out here the way it was. Everybody was scared of it, and they were scared to go help the folks that did have it, afraid they'd get it, and it was very contagious. I was told of whole of complete families that died with it, and nobody to bear. It was awful fun. Plenty of this old lumber around, and they get build a box, then build a, a, a casket and cover it in cloth if they had that much. I remember I hope dig a lot of graves. They put them six feet under. That fever would carry you away. 
I don't see how my daddy lived to go three days and nights in a coma, you know, with, but he did. He come back out of it. Hey, I'm uh, John Barry. I'm the author of The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history. The 1918 pandemic was in many ways quite different than what we're going through right now. Number one, the virus was much more lethal. Another big difference was today, of course, mostly the elderly are dying. In 1918, probably two thirds of the dead were aged 18 to 45. Another difference was that that virus moved much more quickly through the population than COVID-19. So the net result of all this was a tremendous amount of fear, particularly given the fact that there was fake news back then. The lies were frankly coming directly from the government. Because we were at war and because the Woodrow Wilson's administration believed that anything negative would hurt the war effort, they tried to minimize the pandemic. One doctor, desperate, wrote an article for the Journal of the American Medical Association that he tried injecting hydrogen peroxide into people's veins. Maybe the hydrogen peroxide injected would provide some oxygen into the bloodstream. Exactly half of his patients died and he counted that as a success. One physical aspect of the Spanish flu that we have to bring to bear on what we're going through today is mask wearing. There was no federal mandate to do anything. There was really no federal response to the flu at all. Because of the war effort going on, there was no CDC. There was no National Institute of Health. There was no Department of Health and Human Services. Masks in 1918 aren't what we're talking about today. People were being instructed how to make their own masks out of gauze or what you might call cheesecloth. Even though they were being instructed to wrap them several layers, this was still a pretty much a homemade affair. There are reports, not only from big cities, but even from rural communities of people starving to death because no one had the courage to bring them food, even other members of their own family. So in the worst places, society really did begin to break down. In Vermont, for example, they had what they called an orphan train. They put the kids who had lost their parents on a train and they'd go from depot to depot and anybody who wanted to adopt the kid would just show up at the depot and walk away with them. Because this virus was so unusual in that it was killing people in their 20s, 30s and 40s, it was killing parents and not children. So there was a whole generation of Spanish flu orphans. Um, perhaps the most famous case, Mary McCarthy, who wrote Memories of a Catholic Girlhood, was a Spanish flu orphan. And she described being on the train, going from Seattle, where her parents had lived, to the Midwest where they were going to stay to try and escape the flu. She describes the conductor coming in and her parents are clearly sick with influenza and the conductor tries to put them off the train. And Mary McCarthy describes her father actually taking a gun out and preventing the conductor from putting them off the train and they are able to continue their journey. We do have so many few survivors' accounts of, of what this was like. It was really something that apparently was so terrible that nobody wanted to think or talk or write about it. They just wanted to forget about it and move on. 1920, Warren G. Harding campaigns for president on the idea of return to normality. And that you know, was a winning slogan. It 
did go through as a successive phases. The first phase, the least deadly, at least in the United States, went from sort of March into the springtime. But then flu season returned in September, October, more troops on the move once again, and a real explosion. And that second wave was the most deadly. One person who did get the flu in the spring of 1919 was Woodrow Wilson. Wilson went to Paris, which was having a very bad bout of the flu. He was going, of course, to negotiate the terms of the Versailles Treaty. The Treaty of Versailles officially ended World War I, and with it went all reason for Allied forces to continue the fight against the Bolshevik armies in Russia. The fighting had stopped on November 11th. Wilson was very sick. Wilson recovered, but many people who knew him said he was never the same. There is this suggestion that it affected him and his judgment and what he wanted to accomplish at Versailles because he did relent and concede such more punishing aspects of the retribution given to Germany in terms of the reparations that they would have to pay. Punishing terms certainly contributed eventually to the rise of Hitler and the Nazis. But Americans, after the twin horrors of the influenza and the losses in the war, people just wanted to forget. They wanted to get back about their lives. The Rosie the Riveter of World War II, it happened in World War I as well. Those women came back and said, no, we're not going back to normal. We fought and struggled. We were on the front lines of the war and the fight against the flu. We won our place. It's no coincidence that shortly after the women get the right to vote in 1920, the beginning of a great change in women's social status in this country. Fashions change. This is the era of the flapper. We tend not to think about history in terms of disease. This is an important part of history that we don't always teach or talk about. And that's another reason why the Spanish flu piece of World War I history was left out. I was raised in a Christian family and we had our evening prayers. I knew I had to do my part. I came home one day and Mama was stretched out on a pallet in front of the fireplace. Oh, I panicked. Mama, Mama, are you, are you sick? She said, no child, I'm just so tired. I wanted to get as close to the fire as I could. She said, I knew if I got into that bed that she... <laughs> I might not ever get up. <laughs> it brought families closer together, and it brought our little town closer together because we all suffered losses through war, then through the epidemic. To be aware that it could happen again. Children need to learn about what could happen but the shock wave that sets in when something like this happens kind of stuns people, you know. They go beyond thinking correctly. It was depressing to me. Be aware. Be aware.